Yesterday, we had a, a chat with uh, Andrew Sirtis and uh, Steve from Bacon Wake. So me and my pal Rad want you to take a look at this chat and uh, subscribe to uh, Steve. Uh, the link is in the description. Thanks a lot for following. See you later. Bye. Hey everybody, welcome. Uh, Steve here from Baked and Wick. Uh, happy to have you joining me today with two very special guests, Philip Drujinin and Andreas Exertus, uh, two friends and colleagues from the Mud Flood and Tartaria research community. I have both fellas standing by getting ready to join us here in just a moment as we listen to a presentation from 2011 that I stumbled upon recently on a fairly random search for this, what I at the time was pronouncing as New Madrid fault line uh, earthquake event. Uh, I think a couple other people in the community may have done some coverage on this at some point in time, but it doesn't immediately spring to mind who has or has not. I'm sure those of you who are watching might help us in the comments in the chat stream. But I was interested in it, had obviously been led towards it through someone's post or other, maybe even on social media. Um, the presenter is a university professor presenting to possibly students or possibly a lay group at some sort of public facing conference in 2011. The video doesn't appear to have been discovered or viewed or at least commented on by anyone from uh, who's familiar with mud flood or the grand tartaria mysteries um a lot of which uh we of course collectively look into as as individuals and as members of the community here and of course those of you who probably tune in for this live stream today will all be pretty up on your mud flood theory um it does look like the fellows are ready to go i'm going to bring them both on welcome them to the show um and it will briefly discuss our plan for slowly increasing the speed of the playback of this 36 minute presentation so we can get through it a little bit, uh, you know, streamlined together. Uh, let's have uh, Philip join us. Oh, I just, I think we might have, Andreas went away. Hopefully he'll come back in the lobby here in a moment. Let's add Philip to the stream. Hey, what's up? Philip, welcome, how are you, sir? Pretty good. How are you? Great, great, great. Great to see you as always. Uh, so we briefly lost Andreas, so I'll, I'll welcome you and uh, say first off, thanks for joining us late in the evening, as you often do. Uh, for me, it's always hard to stay up and be awesome at this time of night. So thanks for doing that for us. And yeah, thanks. Thank yeah, you. absolutely. Uh, but uh, are you well? How are things on your end? Uh, I don't know. Pretty much fine, right? According to what was scripted, we have a pretty good situation right now. Mm -hmm. so well, whatever you whatever you ask specific, I I can reply. But right, in, sure. In general, everything's okay. General status: you're in, you're intact. You're still here. You're working on all the same sort of things uh, that well i kind of lost the interest uh to several topics after uh, i saw the increase of pressure that was taken on the information lately this summer specifically so so i'm not saying uh the topic is totally lost no it's not lost but it's like in the pause because you know uh, I'm working on something big, and uh, this something big is always ruined by some other plans. I was trying to make video on Androids, and if everything is like you know stops at at the point, then I get more facts, and uh, so I have to bring more information, and so I can upgrade the videos that I already made, and then I used uh, this uh, um, the system of uploading when I upload some some of my, of, my, of my future content to YouTube to see if any charges will come up uh, on the unlisted video. And then 
now you have to take like two, three months before you can upload the content. And so I'm like waiting until uh, I get a clean version of uh, uh, the footage I want to play. So this is why it's important to not be censored immediately after you publish the video and uh, you get the uh, zero views, like, you know, so. yeah. Yeah. Because the topic is really important and, you know, some people already brought the information um, on these bio robots and stuff like this and uh, all these movies that we saw in, in Hollywood, like, you know, you, you name it, you can name yeah. a bunch of movies about it, including one, 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 one of my favorite is like uh, Alien or, th or something, I don't know, about the creature uh, that was uh, eating people like a little lizard or dinosaur that was, mm -hmm. you know. And so that they had an android there uh, who, who had a copy, an upgraded, uh, upgraded copy, uh, which didn't have any feelings and so on. So it like, kind of reminds me the story I want to talk about. Well, I look forward to, I'm sure as we all do, hearing that story when you've got it ready to share with us. And uh, I'm glad you've even indicated that much to us that we have that to look forward to for sure. Um, Philip, I'm pleased to say Andreas looks like he's joined us. He's back. Why don't we bring him in? I don't Andreas. know if that's a good idea. Uh, hey, you're here now. <laughs> he's in the door. Uh, good to see you, sir. God, I love What's you guys. Up? Scott, I love your shirt, I have to say. There you go. Heavy metal. Look at that. Uh, I, looked, I looked for both of your shirts. I found this one first. Awesome. That's I got a couple of new designs. Back. If you saw the new wraparounds, right. they look super hyphy. Right. I do like to roll that like V1 OG vibe, you know, oh, yeah. probably, you're, I don't know if they're still the thing or not. Can you still get these or you're, they you're a foundling foundry member? Yeah. There we go. I mean, there the we way go. they are special. There's, there's, there's great it's things in the works. I, I, I have artery Nova. I have, I have to plug it. I'm sorry. Go to go. get some exertus gear, but I was, <laughs> Free plug right there. I do love the Tartar Nova. But I was going to say I really agree and feel with uh, what Philip's saying because I've been going through that every day. Like my videos, I'll get a random check. They'll be like, this video is 18 and above only. I'm like, there's no curse words in this video. We don't say anything. And then they'll be like, well, you talked about modern acts of terror. I'm like, what? And then, okay, somebody at like line two talks, you know, two, 20 minutes in talks about uh, 1940s hotel fire in Vegas. And they're like, that's a modern act of, I was like, what? Like, so there's a lot of pushback right now. And it's great that we've got, you were t using Odyssey and Libri. Uh, so I've been pushing to use that as well. Yep. I think you're on the right track with that. I mean, obviously we're here today. Um, we're not doing this there uh, <laughs> first, but right. yeah, I mean, they're I feel lost. the same way as both of you guys do. Um, my general level of my, my rate of putting out content this entire summer has been a little bit slower um and i feel like somehow i'm already generally being more circumspect in all of my not only my content but even my social media presence because of like this vibe that i feel that's like you know they've been watching us but they're really watching us these days and they're doing you know they're doing things to accounts that are surprising and shocking and impactful negatively impactful to accounts that are trying to educate and speculate and have fun together and do nothing uh that i can even imagine is dangerous or to be discouraged um i went ahead and i proactively a while back this has been a few months now i probably shot myself in the foot by doing this you guys but my entire channel i marked the whole thing age restricted on youtube mm -hmm. Forget it. I don't care. You know, Junior, well, you, you probably don't want, you know, Junior you can want, get on anyway, as we yeah. know. You okay. probably don't want five year old kids necessarily watching Baked in Awake. I get that. Exactly. I, exactly. I, I, I try really hard not to curse. Anywhere, you know, they don't need I, to get it from me. I try really hard not to curse. So I mm -hmm. felt like I tried really hard. It was <laughs> like when, so the other day, Twitter shut down for like an hour because they had mm -hmm. messed up and they, you know, Jack Dorsey's indicted for what he did. But they basically shut their whole thing down. Now, I almost want to like imagine if you constantly are afraid that your account's going to get shut down for some ridiculous reason or other, and you're, all of a sudden you're getting these like terrors from Twitter glitches. I feel like I should sue for emotional distress for just thinking my account was down, you know? 100%. Well, <laughs> people have harmed themselves and gone into crisis over that kind of thing. So, yeah. 
Uh, and I'm not saying that's always an appropriate reaction to something like that. Um, I try to be of the mind that this is temporary. It's not really guaranteed. Um, archive what I can meaningfully. And if it's worth it to me and it has the legs or I feel like it has the value that people will need it again somewhere sometime, then I'll try to always find ways to get what little contribution I've made to, you know, general consensus reality um, back up. But anyhow. Uh, well, that's the beauty yeah. of um, the video that we're, we're watching right now, because in the, in the Tartaria paradigm, or in general of the reset culture civilization paradigm, you're looking at a civilization that's far more advanced than we are now that was reset far harder than we've been yet. So it's kind of calming to know that like whatever's coming is way more intense <laughs> than anything we've ever experienced yet that we can remember. Uh, I agree. Let me... Let me check. Uh, I'm going to test a couple of little things about our interface. Look at that. We just got a little bit more equal. We're getting ready to screen share here in just a moment. So, guys, um, I'm sure everybody loves hearing our respective uh, status updates. And um, again, it's a real pleasure to have both of you on hanging out with me together. That's so rad. Um, I, as I said before you guys came on, I just found this talk so interesting and i don't know if it's connected to you know the real mud flood or not or grand tartaria or not but it's a really interesting story he drops just a couple of interesting phrases that uh indicate to me that there's more to his story than he's even giving us in this presentation um it led me to another talk that I found after this that we're not doing today that I almost wished I would have subbed in for this one because the title of that talk given in 2013 by yet another professor, a uh, lady professor, was the, the lost history of the new Madrid earthquakes. And it talks even more about that side of that narrative. Um, I'll include it for people in the, in the description for this show. I don't think it made it. Yeah, I, will, I, I just watched this uh, lady. There we go. Great. Okay. So you have a little bit of that context yeah. as well, Philip. Brilliant. Um, Not a little bit. Everything. Good, good. Everything. good. I got Love everything. It. Um, so we're going to listen to um, Dr. Ray Anderson's talk first. Guys, you have both the chat, our private chat feature, as well as audible mics. We can, we can mute ourselves and listen. You can come back off of mute and say, pause, please, at any point, if you'd like to, uh, you know, discuss a certain statement he just said, does happened? this work again did i m mess up my mic or you can you can hear it okay you're cool. great everybody's super good and i can see when you guys are muted or not so i'll try to help you uh on that front um let me queue up our screen we're ready on screen share so i just need to let's see share no i'm going to restart that screen share and make sure i do it the exact right way share audio from that tab and this is our tab. Okay. Guys, I'll slowly increase speed as we go until eventually, oh, I'm already there. I'm at, I'm at helium speed. There it is. We're gonna start at regular speed and then ease our way into a little bit faster playback speed to just get through it a little quicker. Okay, well, most of the world's earthquakes are along these crustal plates. The Earth, of course, is divided into a whole series of big plates that constitute our crust. All these plates are moving different directions, different speeds, you can tell by the arrows here. And of course, doing that, they're interacting with one another in all sorts of ways. One of the main ways that these things react is at spreading centers. These are the areas toward the center of the plate. You usually find them in the center of the ocean. <coughs> the plates are diverging from one another. They're actually moving apart. Magma is coming in underneath and making new oceanic crust. So there's always a lot of earthquakes along those. Another one is a subduction zone. That's where one plate is going under another plate. That's a really a whammy place for earthquakes. That's where all the big ones are along subduction zones. Not only that, subducting plates melt and produce magmas that have volcanoes. And so 
where you see these subduction zones, like all around the edge of the Pacific here, you'll see lots and lots of volcanoes and lots and lots of earthquakes. And finally, the third way these plates interact is what we call a strike slip fault. In other words, they just slide sideways past one another. This is a fairly gentle, you would think, but this is what we have going on in Southern California. So all of Southern California earthquakes, and most of the ones we see there, are <coughs> generated by the strike slip movement of these two plates. Okay, I mentioned the volcanoes are associated with the subduction zones. Here's uh, some of the Earth's volcanoes. You can see by far the most of them are in these areas where there were subduction zones around these plates. And then there's a few others mixed in here and there for other reasons. And earthquakes, the same thing. Here's the location of all the earthquakes from 2010. You can see again, they really mark out these plate boundaries really well. So far this year, the same story. Now, if we look at the largest earthquakes in the world, once again, we have them right associated with these plate boundaries and associated with subduction zones. The biggest one here in Chile, 9.5 back in 1960. The biggest one in the United States was up here at Prince William Sound, 9.2 back in 1964. You remember the Sumatra earthquake that generated the big tidal wave? That Checks in at number three at 9.1, and then the Japanese earthquake just this year, 9.0, is the fourth largest recorded in history. So again, these are all around subduction zones, all at plate boundaries. Earthquakes were uh, were uh, identified by their their intensity for a lot of years using a scale that uh, Giuseppe Mercalli, a uh, Italian scientist, came up with, and this is based mainly on how the earthquake is felt and how much damage it's done. So it goes all the way from a magnitude 12 up to a magnitude 1 that are not usually felt. Then in 1935, Charles Richter came by and did a real, uh, created a scientific way of doing this, actually using seismograph to measure the amplitude of the earthquake. He used that to come up with the scale. This, we look at how often these large earthquakes happen on Earth. The magnitude 8 ones, the largest ones, we get one of those a year, maybe. So on down, the 7 to 9s, 15 a year, the 6 to 7s, you get about... 134 a year, all the way down to the little two to three ones, and that's about 1.3 million of those every year. So the Earth is very dynamic. Lots of earthquakes going on everywhere. And ever since man has been putting houses up, earthquakes have been knocking them down. We've had our share of big ones in the United States. The Charleston earthquake in 1885 killed 60 people. And then, of course, the California earthquake, the San Francisco earthquake, I mean, between that earthquake and the fire, killed 3,000 people. It was one of the biggest ones, in, the biggest one in U.S. history. The Alaska earthquake, uh, the Alaska earthquake at Prince William Sound was the biggest in U.S. history, size-wise, a 9.2, only 125 people killed. Sort of uh, the same deal that we have in New Madrid, not a lot of people around, like they were in San Francisco. Okay, but let's get to the New Madrid one, the one we want to talk about today. New Madrid earthquakes uh, occurred right in the area that is now the boot heel of, of uh, Missouri and adjoining parts of Tennessee and Kentucky. In that three-month period, as I say, they had these three earthquakes that were very large and lots of little ones in between. Uh, the three earthquakes in this, this area were kind of the center of everything. And uh, if you look at how they were actually felt, we only really know much about the eastern half of the US because as far as population in the western half, there uh, wasn't really anybody to report. But this particular map shows that the earthquake was felt as far away as New Hampshire, down in Georgia, over in New Orleans. And uh, if you put the scale up there, you can see how strong that is. Basically ruinous destruct destruction here in the magnitude nine area very bad destruction in the magnitude eight and, and so on out. Here's an example of some of the reported uh, effects of that earthquake at distance. Louisville, for instance, this is Louisville right here, I believe, uh, had a number of houses that were destroyed there and, and lots of other chimneys and parapets, et cetera, knocked down. Cincinnati, a little farther up here, also had some chimneys destroyed and, and uh, parts of buildings knocked down. South Carolina, cracked chimneys reported. In Georgia, bricks were thrown off of chimneys. We know that there were church bells rung in Boston and also in Charleston. So this energy really went out a long <laughs> ways. It was a big one. But it's again, not much in the way of, of injuries. This is what the population looked at like at the time. All this area in green here, two people per mile or less, and in most cases less is the operable term. So you can see there wasn't really a lot of people to get injured there. Here's another map that shows some of the report. This was published by a U.S. Geological Survey 100 years after the earthquake. 1912. We can zoom in on that a little bit. These blue dots indicate places where people actually heard a noise of the earthquake. If you can imagine, all the way over to Savannah and Charleston, Washington, D.C., and Baltimore. Holy cow. It was just felt in these other places, Middlebury, Vermont, Boston, etc., New Orleans. Now, most of the actual damage was done in this little area.
where, where there's a lot of destruction there and almost total destruction in that purple area. Well, that's a kind of a funny shape. What does that mean? Well, this is an area where there was major liquefaction. This is an area where there's floodplain of the river. There are very loose and poorly consolidated sediments in that area. It's not a good place to be if you're having an earthquake. Uh, just for example, here's Memphis, Tennessee, and they have uh, almost 2,000 feet of unconsolidated material here in the middle. All that stuff is going to shake like crazy. Matter of fact, if we look at what an earthquake does when it hits that kind of material. In rock, an earthquake might be this strong. That same earthquake up here will be much stronger. It's going to move the ground around a lot more. You have a house up there, it's a big trouble. Liquefaction, another problem. Well, what is liquefaction? Liquefaction is when you have a lot of sand particles with water all around them, and you shake it all up, and all the sand particles settle down. The water goes to the top. The buildings are sitting on water, and they tip over. This is from, from Japan, but uh, there was a lot, a lot of liquefaction. A lot of liquefaction associated with kind of mad with all. Here's the kind of <laughs> this is definitely one of the spots that piqued my interest in this talk, of course. Water comes to the surface, it's under pressure, water's underlying material, finds its own weakness and shoots up to the surface and carries a lot of sand and, and debris up with it. That's what's called a sand blow. And this is kind of what they look like on an aerial photograph. They can cover a, a big area. And in the case of Amanda, this is supposedly one of the biggest areas of, of these kind of liquefaction sand blow effects that, uh, that has ever been noted anywhere on Earth. They're talking about tens of thousands of square miles covered with sand and water that they've used up and out of the ground. Or well, remember these features, we'll talk about them in a few minutes here on a different aspect. Well, the liquefaction can also cause the land above it to collapse. And this happens on riverbanks, et cetera, cliffs, bluffs. And here's an example of what happens when the ground underneath this bluff liquefies. Lots and lots of this kind of stuff going on in the Mandarin, too. Okay, HUD put together this map that kind of shows the, the damages. These are the actual places that reported damage associated with this quake. As a matter of fact, if you look at some reports, you see, for instance, people that were living in the uplands here, away from that sort of loose soil, uh, slept right through it in Cincinnati or other places in Cincinnati are getting their chimneys knocked down. St. Genevieve, which is real close to it. St. Genevieve got moved because they were down in the floodplain. They got flooded out, so everybody packed up and moved up on the hill. And when the earthquake came, it did very little damage there. St. Louis really had a little damage. And again, a lot of St. Louis at the time was, was up in the hills. Well, we have plenty of reports of really interesting things that happened associated with this. All these little pink guys here, these are reports uh, from eyewitnesses at the time that uh, were there during this. Uh, in this case, most of these are from that very first December earthquake. We can look at the fellow down here, Mr. Bradbury, that was down there. I'll let you read this, and I'll just kind of pick out a, a few things there. He was awakened by this tremendous noise. He was on his boat. The, the waves started shaking in the boat. The boat started bouncing up and drowned. There was all kinds of loud noises coming off. And then pretty soon, the, the cliffs under the banks of the side of the river began to collapse into the river. And when they were falling, they were kicking up so much water that they were afraid of the, the boat being capsized by the waves. So that, that's one experience there. This may be the, the book you were looking for, I'm not sure. <laughs> Another one up here in this little town of Little Prairie, just south of New Madrid here. This fellow's talking primarily about the fissures and stuff that opened up. And as the, as the ground rolled, I could see, he said you could see the low spots in between it, and in some cases it would split open and a fissure would drop down. Now this isn't one of these kind of things that's gonna swallow you. They got maybe 12 feet deep or something like that. People crawled out of them, but they, there were cattle and other things that fell into them that they would have had to get out of there. He also commented on the sand blows, blowing up the sand and water, eight to 10 feet above the land surface, and the strong sulfur smell that you get with all the rotting vegetation and everything that was down there. Finally, here's a report from up in New Madrid. This is, this is really pretty interesting. The, the town of New Madrid, most of it either slumped into the river or sunk down when, when this earthquake happened. And so he talks about here some of the um, giant sand blows blowing up. He's got a 10 to 15 feet, though. Uh, and then he talks about sitting on his horse as the land settled down. And down there's a lot of solar thing up his horse. Amazing. Sinking black liquid rising up to the belly of my horse. Uh, but anyway, he talks about all the craters. But anyway, he talks about all the craters and everything. He also talks about all the All right, I want to I want to pause him right there. I want to pause him right there briefly, guys, and uh, observe that. So to me, this was really interesting. The, the descriptions of the event and the li the liquefaction and even people's firsthand reports that were written down and spread in the newspapers of the time and kept in the journals, their personal journals. Uh, this one report that he just cited with the with the man on horseback with the with the earth that sank up to his horse's belly, um, you know this is pretty wild to me in Middle America, and it also uh, 
speaks to, as do the images that he's sharing, to the incredible degree of like reshaping of the entire geography that took place during this period of time. Um, people moved away in the wake of these some 400 or more quakes that happened in the first two months of this event uh, with thousands of smaller ones reported afterwards. So this went on for months afterwards and people got so scared that it was never going to stop that, you know, towns became ghost towns in some cases, you know, others like New Madrid, as, as we, uh, excuse me, as I shared on uh, a comment or a little banner earlier, this was a former Spanish territory. So uh, named for Madrid, you know, Madrid, Spain, but these folks in this region of North America refer to it as Madrid, which is interesting and, and quaint to me. Uh, well, but, it was given. To, it was given to the Spanish by the French. The French. The French were like, okay, technically we're not supposed to have yeah. this anymore. Let's figure out. Yeah, so we'll give it away. But like, they were never really that like up that far up. They were more Norman, Norman Germanic Spanish right. and then French. Right. I think. I think that it was French. Yeah, uh, the Spanish had it first, and at the or. or the French may have given it over to the Spanish for a certain amount of time or lost it to them for a certain amount of time. But right before we got it from Napoleon, the uh, Spanish had ceded it back to the French or given it back to the French. Um, so uh, but we did get it in the Louisiana Purchase, of course. So uh, it's, it's, it's just it's just a city. The New Madrid was founded by the Spaniard. It's not uh, like the area was Spanish or something. Oh, it was Spanish, not. like I, I don't believe it was Spanish at all. Well, they they had a map and they said that we did it, we want this, but I don't think they ever got that far. And they were dealing with trackers. Yeah, is, who had. So Spain gave it back to France in 1800. This is according to the Wikipedia on this is is all. Uh, but they did have a weird. So the weird thing about it was they were trying to make it a little bit Spanish for a minute uh, in that area. Uh, the the founder bernardo de galvez of this town um he was appointed to rule spanish louisiana the land west of the mississippi he welcomed settlers from the u.s but required them to become citizens of spain in addition they had to agree to live under the guidance of his appointed empresario colonel william morgan who wasn't spanish he right. was an american revolutionary war vet from new jersey which perfect of course. <laughs> uh, so that's a weird, funny little, they tried to create a little Spanish fiefdom there, uh, but obviously that's there's really also not. because of the, the trading so. that was going on. So the, the, so what happened was France had lost Haiti and Spain wanted to make a deal with France yep. that would strengthen to get back. To give this Saint Dominique. Get back. Yep. Yeah, yep. and but the thing is, it's so far north and so far west that you have to follow the water lines, and the water lines have changed. And the maps, they say, of course, were inaccurate, but I doubt it. If you look at Jean Cartier, who is from northwest France, helped uh, get that far in, you start seeing the Viking stones that go all the way that far. And yeah. again, Madrid's not the south part of Spain. It's it's the north part of Spain, arguably the center, center but it's more north. And the people there are more saxon viking um there are the tall germanic looking spaniards there so it, it does make sense you know yeah it, it it was just a a really weird coincidence to me i know the timing is we yes, are the, every territory that was uh, after you know maybe 17th century that was assigned to the united states of somehow in the future uh like Louisiana, California, Alaska, every every territory has its legend and its questions and the problems in the official explanation. You won't find any territory without, uh, you know, pure, uh, simple explanation with, with the pure, simple explanation. Sure. Every, state, also, yeah. every state was purchased or like, you know, I would say robbed and then it was like kind of rewritten and yep. it made up story like they purchased well, something or uh, loaned something. It was just the frontier. They were killing those people who were living locals. I call them locals. 
right and uh, just uh, if you listen to that lady actually she yeah. was telling the best sure story in the beginning and she was the official story that that area was highly populated before this new madrid event it was highly populated it was a very very uh cultural well known. center trade center trading center yeah. first of all it was trading center between indians the and the european so-called population you know yeah. but, but we there's saw always a couple levels of the story i love that there's like what happens to the people while they're in new madrid but then it has nothing to do with historical story because usually someone in delaware and connecticut are arguing over like some land that they've never been to they don't even really seen the map prop and they just draw like they'll just draw a line and they'll say, okay, everybody from Delaware, they can go to uh, Michigan and everybody from Connecticut, they can take over this land we'll call Minnesota or something. And it's like, then there's people living there. There's the Indians, there's traders, there's their kids who've mixed together. There's an entire new culture that's developing and they're forgotten because they're so far away and disconnected from the East coast colonies that were trying to take over and recolonize them that you've got the, the history that's there and then the history about it from some far away. Yep. Yeah. What this actually covering is that, that they had a trading, you know, outposts, I would say a line of trading outposts, which were actually created as, you know, some cities and towns right now. And many, many of them, uh, you know, are still existing on the map. But what I'm trying to say is that if there was a highly cultural and trading area and efficient economy was booming there, uh, so we can, we can, you know, say whatever now, because we don't have any evidence of any big large constructions or something like pyramids of or anything there right we don't have any megalithic structures in that area we don't have any red bricks uh, buildings and constructions that were located there and, and and built there before like you know united states period and and so on so so we cannot actually say what was happening there and did they actually have a wooden you know construction civilization mm -hmm. or was it i don't know what was it actually so right. nobody actually knows if right. there was just a series in groups of wooden forts then was it a civilization no it wasn't right so if well, we don't have any constructions a, like what we have in, a, in in europe right we can go and find construction of 17th century 18th century 16th century which officials claim to be this period of construction and we can find it and at that area you won't find anything that is older than 17 something right so what i'm trying to say is uh if that was to you know erase the memory of so-called reset of that area right if that was the huge event of the reset it was a very long one and it doesn't seem natural as what they claim for me right now it doesn't seem natural because you know maybe those players are just trying to tell us that you know we want to make some money of this new madrid theory right now we want to make seismic budget growing and so we can you know make uh, you know more spendings on seismic uh, warning seismic systems and seismic uh, you know precautions and drills and so on and so on so this that would be this particular researcher does appear to consult heavily with the uh, local industry, the fracking industry, and of course, uh, has I, I looked into him a little bit, and he has many research papers on the entire area surrounding the New Madrid, um, yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, event and fault line, etc. So certainly, uh, that is an interesting and you know helpful perspective to. Yeah, but even the name, even the name Manu Madrid kind of insinuates more than geography that there's architecture. You wouldn't name something New Madrid unless you had found or are planning on building some of the most impressive architecture outside of. Madrid. I like the I like the coincidence. You know, I won't I don't want to speculate too hard right off the cuff. Uh, why don't we why don't we roll back in let this gentleman continue um but i love these observations guys keep them coming and everybody keep it going in the in the chat um love seeing you all here and appreciate you guys let's uh jump back in for a few so it's been a pretty fascinating thing to see now here's 
This is how you measure it. And right up in that area, there was a lot of other things going on. So I'm going to blow that area up here and take a look at it. This is where the real foot fault crosses the river right in this area. And this was a fault that was active during the February earthquake. Now, what this fault is, is this is a thrust fault. So in other words, the plate up to the south, this plate down here is sliding up and over the plate to the north. So when this gets moved this way, it basically rises up. So right along this zone, the land lifted up about 30 feet. Well, what do you suppose that do to the river? You got these big bulges, and of course the water's outside up here, it goes racing back down. And uh, on the way, there were escarpments formed by this, and so there were waterfalls. It was right to be some of these 12 feet waterfalls going down over the side. But uh, right here, particularly, as the water goes shooting back, this was where the idea that the river actually flowed backwards. Here's what some of that lake looked like. Now, these are pictures that were, were published by that is fuller. And uh, this was like I said, years ago. And just went fast and I'm slowing him down because he's showing great images right here. Not a lot, a lot. So you can see what this lake is. These are all thrust forced down, down by the rising water level there. Here's one of the sand blows that came up through a, a section that was cut into the ground. These trees got literally tipped over by the, by the earthquake and then started growing upward again. That sand blows phenomenon I need to know more about. Where the land actually went up. And so, so the swamp drained away. away. So here it was the original swamp level at the time. And now here's the ground level. So you can see that went uh, a couple meters probably up that land did. Plus, uh, people in, in as far away as Louisville and Cincinnati felt as many as 2,000 individual quakes in that period of time. Uh, reports said that basically the ground has never stopped shaking. So this, this is really a pretty incredible earthquake. Well, let's talk a little bit about the geology. Why, why is this an area seismically prone in the first place? Well, it really goes back to a long time ago. It goes back to a thing called a hot spot. A hot spot is something that uh, happens that we really don't know a lot about, but apparently magma from right down at the outer core moves up through the mantle and all the way to the surface in this giant upwelling creates a, a hot spot at the surface there. There's lots of volcanoes with these hot spots, generally speaking. Hawaii's a hot spot, Noah's a hot spot, Iceland's a hot spot. But one of the things it often does is it bulges up the land. And when this ground bulges up like that, it sort of naturally splits into three splits. It's called a triple junction in geology. Now, if this rifting continues, if this uplifting continues, two of these will connect and actually break open. And this is how oceans are formed. So an ocean would form between those. Well, this is Rodinia. This was a super continent. 700,000, 700 million years ago, and a million years, 700 million years ago. Supercontinent means all the major continental masses are all together in one spot. Well, what happened about that time is it started to break up. And one of the reasons it broke up where this hotspot was wandering across there, breaking things up. So a hotspot appeared there and had a triple junction and then moved over here, created another triple junction, and the ocean drifted off between there and around all these other places. So one of these failed arms, one of the arms that didn't open up, is the real foot rift. So that was the origin of how all of the geology started at this point. But that is really far from the end, because about 300 million years later, continents got back together again to form a supercontinent. And what happened there was our northern continent, Laurasia, got smashed into by Gondwanaland, pushed up a bunch of mountains all along the collision course, pushed up a few interior mountains, pushed in some basins, did a lot of geology there. And we ended up with the supercontinent of Pangaea. Here's about where the matter would have been on that. That's right up in there. Well, of course, in, in due course, that continent broke up. And, uh, and during the Cretaceous, shortly after the breakup, another hotspot apparently came by and uh, dwell, domed up right underneath there again. And this time, rather than splitting and forming an ocean, it just eroded very deeply down into that bulge. And that became what we call the Mississippi Embayment and become the Mississippi River Basin. This is what caused most of this flat area through here. Now, this, and this basin has been subsiding ever since the hotspot went away, basically, and filling with sediments. That's how all these new sediments that do all the damage got in there. We know a lot of this because of things like gravity surveys. This shows a variation of the Earth's gravity in that area. Seismic surveys, where we actually send shock waves into the ground to bounce back and, and measure what's down there. And we've been able to put together a story like this. This is what it looks like at depth, way down to the crystalline rocks in the basement. There's your rift filled with sediments, and there's actually some volcanic rocks that are squirted up in between here. So there's lots of fault zones, lots of zones of weakness in there. And subsequently, lots and lots of earthquakes. Here's a series of charts starting out from 1974 to 75, 76. There's five years later, 10 years, 20 years. You can see how these earthquakes build up primarily along these three major treads right here. These are the three fault zones that actually broke loose across the earthquake in 1811 and 1812. And they're the ones that are still active. We know if we look at faults that are what we call quaternary faults, faults that are formed in the last, say, 3 million years. This is what 
from 74 to 76, 74 to 77, 74 to 79, et cetera, 10 years, 20 years. So here's New Madrid now. It's right out in the middle of this plate. We already talked about all of the earthquakes going on around the side of the plate. So uh, why is that area still tectonically active, whether it has a rift or not? Well, one of the things that has come to light relatively recently, kind of an interesting story, about 30 million years ago, this would have been uh, in the Jurassic, uh, the Pacific plate started going under the North American plate. Now, this is a distribution of the plates today. This is what's left of that old Pacific plate, right down there, called the Cocos Now, and this little bit up here called Juan de Fuca. Most of the rest of it went underneath, and that's what we call the Farallon plate. Well, rather than sinking straight into the mantle like these subducting plates usually do, this one, for some reason or other, slid almost parallel to the surface underneath North America. And as it moved along, it pushed up some of these coastal ranges, it pushed up the Rocky Mountains, and it seems to have gone about as far as New Madrid. And uh, we know that from a number of things. We take a map here that shows the thickness of the crust. We see this area here that really corresponds to where this slab is presently at, starting to sink into the ground, right in the middle of the continent. <laughs> you can see again this uh, fellow Forte and other put together this thing called predicted surface dynamic topography. And this is basically looking at a number of things. It's telling you what the crust is doing. The reddish areas, the crust is kind of moving upward. The purple areas is moving downward. So that slab is apparently sinking into the mantle right here underneath the Madrid, pulling down, tugging down on that rift zone, keeping it active. We get another view of this using a thing called seismic tomography. Now, what tomography is, is you have a lot of earthquake stations that measure earthquakes from all over the world. And as these earthquakes come to these various stations, they arrive at different times, and the various waves arrive at different times at different strengths, and you're able to plug all that in and figure out what kind of rocks these waves actually went through on the way up to the seismic stations. And people that are smarter than I do that kind of stuff. And this is what it looks like, and this is what the direction of the movement of the rocks are based on that tomography. So if we highlight this, here's the pharaoh. This is a cross section here, basically along that line. So this is an east-west cross section, basically across North America. Right through here, you see the Farallon plate is sinking into the ground, right underneath the Madrid. Here's another north-south line running through the Madrid. So this would be cutting right through here, and sure enough, we can see the thickness of the plate going into the ground there. So it really looks like this Farallon plate has something to do with it. Now we're going to learn an awful lot more about that in the next few years. There's this project going called EarthSoap, which is a National Science Foundation project to put a series of seismic stations in all across the country. They put them in, in a strip put another one in, and then two years later, this one moves over there, two years later, that one moves over there, and working its way across the country. They put this group in this year, 2011, <coughs> so next year they're going over there. So I, they're actually starting to do proposals and stuff to do work on the data that comes from here. This is a lot of really closely spaced seismic stations that are going to give us a lot better resolution of what's going on as far as that plate and depth. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what they learn from this. We've also had another idea recently about what might be causing this earthquake or this series of earthquakes, continued earthquake activity. And that's uh, what's called glacial isostatic rebound. Whoops. Oh, shucks, I lost one of my slides. What isostatic rebound is, anyway, is uh, as the glaciers move down over this land, that, that's a big, thick layer of ice. This may be several thousand feet of ice. That's a lot of weight. And you pile that much weight up on the crust, and it actually sags, makes the crust sag down, it pushes down and gets the plastic handle and actually deforms the crust. So then after the ice melts, it takes a while for the crust to slowly work its way back up. That, that's glacial rebound. And these people here, Groman and, and Zobak, have, uh, they studied the Laurentide ice sheet. This was the most recent one. It only went this far. And uh, in doing that, they calculated that the stress fields here ought to be focused right about an area of the Madrid. So this may be another driving mechanism. I thought that's kind of interesting that they picked that Laurentide ice sheet because it was actually a pre-Illinois pre ice sheet that came much closer, was much thicker, would have been a much stronger factor. I don't know why they didn't consider that. So this is another possibility. A lot of things in geology we don't know. There's just a lot of things about this fault zone we don't know. Okay, so we look at seismicity in North America. Or in the, you see the size of the circles represent the size of the earthquake. Of course, most of the earthquakes are out there along the continental margin there. Only a few of them in here. Why is that important that we study the ones in here? Well, here's what happens when you get an earthquake of 6.8 and one almost the same size in California. This is the area that's affected. A huge area in the eastern part of the country is affected, and only a small area in the western part of the country. This is because the eastern part of the United States is older. The rocks are older, the crust is thicker, they're cooler, they're denser, and so they transmit sound waves or seismic shock waves much more efficiently. In this case, an order of magnitude more efficiently than the earthquakes out in California do. So uh, when they have a magnitude 5 earthquake in California, it would be about the same as a magnitude 4 earthquake here. So these are earthquakes, although they're the same magnitude as some of these out on the west coast, do a lot more damage and are felt over a lot bigger area. 
Now, not many people get killed by earthquakes in the U.S. I think this chart here shows that there's an average of about 10 to 20 per year. Of course, one earthquake really drives it up, and we don't have that many. But uh, chances of getting killed by an earthquake aren't, aren't very good. Here's another chart that looked at. Period of time between 1811 and 1983, average about nine a year. This is some other causes of death in 1996. So you have a lot better chance of being killed by uh, uh, football or skateboard. <laughs> But that's not to minimize the threat of one of these things. Can we predict when earthquakes are going to happen? This, this is something that uh, people are always interested in. There's been a lot of things done to help us try to predict the size of these. Johnny Karst. The electricity that comes up when faults are starting to move. Uh, we can measure bulging, et cetera. A lot of different things. One of the things that's been done on the Madrid, actually, quite interesting, is using GPS surveys, global positioning satellites, and uh, you set up a station, and then you measure the exact elevation and location of this down to the centimeter. And you do this, they've done this over a series of about 10 years. So that tells them what areas are moving up, what areas are moving sideways. And uh, interestingly enough, this led to the idea that maybe the Madrid fault's dying out. This is a professor at the University of uh, Northwestern University who's been studying this stuff for 10 years, and he finds very little movement. He thinks that there ought to be movement at the surface for these major faults, so regardless of how deeply they're buried. And so he thinks that the new matter fault may be cold and dying. And uh, the potential is way overestimated for earthquakes, way too much work going into it. But let me tell you, he's really in the minority. Most people don't believe this at all. Most people think there is going to be continuing earthquakes along here. We've seen a continuing record. There's a magnitude 2 earthquake every couple of days down there, and bigger ones often do. When will the next earthquakes occur and where? Well, it's likely to think that they're going to occur along these zones where, where there's been a lot of earthquake activity. But when will the next one occur? This is looking back to these sand blows. These are good geologists, a pretty good idea on when they've occurred in the past. Because what happens when the sand blows up out of the ground like that, it covers up vegetation, and then that vegetation is trapped there. So we can go through, sample that carbon from that vegetation, do carbonation on it, and know what they that blew out of there. So geologists have been going through cutting these deep trenches all over that area, looking at these sand blows and dating them. And from that, they've come up with a series of, of major earthquakes at various locations along here. Beside the 11, or 1811-1812 one, there was one back in 1450, and that date is plus or minus 150 years. You can't always get too accurate carbon dating. Another one about 900 AD, another one about 300 AD, and one way back at 2500 or 2300 BC. So what we, what we would do then is probably look at those dates and say, well, there's 360 years there, 500 years there, 600 years there, a couple thousand years there. There's probably some others that fall into that category. Some of these ones that are constrained probably fit in there. But, but uh, if we just look at these top ones here, we can guess that the recurrence interval is about once every 350 to 600 years. And these things are somewhat periodic. What happens is there's two uh, rock plates that are against one another, and they're, they're moving, and there's a lot of stress and a lot of force. It eventually builds up enough stress that it slips. And it starts building up again, builds up enough stress, and it slips. Both the, Overall force is equal in the period of time that it takes to build up enough stress to slip. Roughly equal. Now, not, if not, if not exactly periodic, but it's roughly periodic. Scientists have put together these risk, and they put together these risk maps and tried to uh, estimate what the dangers of earthquakes in given areas are. Uh, Iowa, you know, so we don't have any dangers in there, and that's pretty much true. Uh, <laughs> but down here, uh, this is what they call their zone three on this map. One of the higher danger areas, the same as the area around San Francisco. Here's another version of doing that. This is what's called a problem probabilistic hazards map. So that tells you what's the probability that the acceleration due to gravity is going to be uh, exceeded. Yeah, it's going to be the acceleration due to gravity. I always have to think about this. Acceleration due to gravity is going to be 10% of the Earth's gravitational field uh, with a 10% probability in 50 years. These are real hard to interpret for me, but there seems to be what the U.S. has picked. GS has picked up on. So here's one of the USGS's new probability map. So there's a probability that uh, you're going to get a, a, a you're, you're going to get a ground acceleration within the next 50 years. There's a 10% probability that it's going to reach the values here. So if you look at the color in there, that's kind of a, an orange color. That's about a seven. So there's about a 10% probability that you get an earthquake seven or so in that area in the next 50 years. And so you can look at there's a 2% probability scale and stuff. Very difficult to understand these for me. You have to get in a mindset for it. But, uh, but they're what they're using. Just uh, pause for a little on this on map. SGS website. So he's trying to say that there is a... Uh, uh, 
probability that it's gonna be hit again in uh, I think he was referring to like the next years? 50 years with these oh, two percent and then a moment before that I thought years. he said 10 percent so, so I don't know. but either way yeah yeah he's kind of sounding like he's minimizing the risk it's like it's like you know um when you want a prediction of something just to re rewind a year ago um november december when i was saying there's going to be a big financial reset this year and it's like a hundred percent probability that it's happening right now and we can call it a big financial reset due to it's been called on davos and everybody else is calling it great reset so uh what is the probability that this guy is right so he's like <laughs> it's like it's probability close to zero right and uh the, the, t the table he was showing before that shows that this data is always revised uh, is due to revision or something. Sure. It's never completely yep. researched. Yeah. So just, you know, put it put it in the square because I have, a, you know, a 16 by 9 camera right now. And I'm mm, in the yeah. right bottom. So my camera. Yeah, I'm trying to. There we go. Is that a little better? Cameras. There we go. That's pathetic. <laughs> it's funny. Doing my best with that, uh, everybody. I love StreamYard. There's so many options. Yeah. There we go. Exactly. Just kind of, I feel like I know it, and then I flub it up a little bit. So, I mean, that lady that you on, you ain't showing today, uh, the lady that you were saying as right. an example, I, I watched the whole video, and she had a, like uh, also said about that somebody wasn't happy about that the, they had a prediction or something. That something's gonna happen and it, did, it didn't happen mm -hmm. but not you know, the way they predicted it anyway not the way they predicted it and so everything happens and happens and happens just go to yellowstone you also find out that this i, I think i think they want to make it another yellowstone there so it's like a mm -hmm. make a tourist attraction story for this you know case and, my hot spot they talked about yeah 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 yeah, yeah. so making yeah. like you know Spots that people can actually visit because people don't have anything to show there actually about the history. They have only some civil wars, uh, you know, monuments and uh, nothing else. They have uh, also, after, you know, all these uh, 1850 plus years, you know, cases, they do have them, but nothing before that. So it's like, well, you've got all this, these nuclear sites in Russia that are like, you're not <laughs> supposed to go back to nature here. It's too nice, but you can't swim here because of the nuclear lakes. Yeah, I think that's kind of the way Yellowstone started. I mean, it was before environmentalists, you know, I mean, there were people that were saying they care about America. No, I mean, th this was a time when people were taking all the minerals and resources. Why would they build nature parks? You should check in the Tartary Nova, uh, Secretary Terry and Brittany has some pretty interesting information on essentially what they refer to as fairy treaties but it might be more to do with just protecting places that had been exploded if there was a giant um similar reactor that we talk about in the 1950s in russia we had some issues in some place in the 80s similarly but there's more uh similarly we could say that this could have been in new madrid something in in, in wyoming similar like god we have these volcanic um plumes that have uh, literally uranium and they're able to naturally produce plutonium which supposedly was supposed to be impossible it makes a more and more sense why they're keeping us out of these places which might have at one point had great civilization but we can't see that all we can see is all of the minerals and ore and evidence that it could be used for that in the future i mean i hear you philip when you pointed out earlier that we don't see even ruins of buildings uh, that are recognizable or uh, that fit the Tartaria mud flood uh, themes that many of us have come to associate, you know, not just red brick, but um, the different no. styles of brick and things uh, that, uh, and, 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 a, and an entire lack of megalithic structures as well. But when we hear a talk like this, and he describes the degree to which in just this one event in 18, 11 and 1812 and the years subsequent to it uh, which we would maybe consider a very late after effect or late part of the entire tartaria mystery timeline 
this is something that's happened perhaps regularly in this area and this part of this continent is particularly soft and mushy and subjected you know no, no what, what i'm trying to say is that we don't have any evidence that something was before that earthquake uh, this is point number one point number two we don't have any evidence of that event at all like because we don't have only one one or two pictures that uh you know from the period that that is way after the case actually it's like 60s and and they, these drawings is not even right. photographs right. drawing right. like lightning in the sky and all this stuff happening so if you believe this as an evidence you might as well suppose that that was a due attack of somebody that was actually trying to scare the people out of this area and you know perform all those earth shakes so they everybody's just running from there for 30 years no is the, they just mine mine the area exploded it and you know got all the resources and left and my that, favorite is the crazy people because they took all the people that saw this 260 days worth of comets explosions volcanoes and you know earthquakes all over the world yeah. and then they said you had napoleon syndrome is what it was called if you had any memory of this happening they put you in an asylum if you wow. didn't say that this didn't happen at the time, they would put you in an asylum. And it so, that oh, yeah. yeah. So no you, one, no one was allowed to know about this. I mean, that's crazy to think about. That like we're talking millions of people, hundreds of thousands of millions, like uh, millions of people around the world were, and their children taking them and turning into foundlings. I mean, we know this from all kinds of stories, but this one is because of this uh, 260 days of apocalyptic weather. You know. Yeah, people did uh, move out of this part of the country uh, in the months following this as the quakes didn't subside right away, too. So that gives you a nice little exchange of people out and a uh, time of quietness and then a return at a later point to that area by new people in, in large part. So uh, but great points, Philip, on on that. And you, you know, make yeah yeah and repopulation also this agenda repeats there also because you know uh, all this mud flood uh, theory that i you know try to promote is that also says that there was repopulated areas after the reset so and i was saying not just mud flood is everybody uh, can claim it to be a, you know just a technology it's not a natural case but this case is presented as to be a natural case yes. and as it was a continuous and uh, unexplainable in uh, in terms of reality of uh, uh, you know current seismic you know mainstream about tectonic plates and so on and so they have to make all, up all this stuff like you know hot spots which are you know popped up of nowhere you know somewhere in the middle of somewhere and you know and all this data is not very you know specific nobody can show any seismic graphs because nobody had any uh devices way back in in this uh, period of time they only started to measure seismic in, in the late uh, 1800s right so and the first one who started measuring Everything felt like an 8.0 to these people back then yeah concerning the liquefaction and all this you know all this area is just a huge river basin which was flooded millions of times every spring it you was flooded put your big megalithic structures there knowing that anyway right it wouldn't be yeah. wise to build that kind of structure and that geological. Yeah, but, but we have this type of the same type of river uh, landscapes in Russia, in Europe, and all those star forts are there, and all those buildings are still there, and nothing happened to them. So, in terms of uh, the same type of uh, timeline since the 1800s, nothing happened. Those star forts are still there, even though they like destroyed and buried, you can still find them, but you cannot find anything there in this Mississippi, Missouri, uh, New Madrid area. So that's my point. I mean, something is definitely hidden in this uh, in this term, but all the evidence they try to present us is invalid to do any research, except that believe them in the theory that they supposedly, and you know, write in the books that been sold to us as, you know, new research, new type of hidden lost knowledge research. So I would say it's just a clickbait 
for the book selling. I keep, I keep uh, wondering though, like how many of the lies are true now, right? Because like my first contingency to start this whole idea of talking about any of these things was that every every lie is telling the truth about something by hiding it, and as I start seeing it, it's like that's more and more true. But sometimes actually they're not even lying; they're just using words in a way that's wrong, so you don't understand what they're saying. It's like a camouflage. Um, one of the things they did in American schooling was say, "Oh, the natives didn't have." Um, giant buildings because they had certain places they would congregate and meet, but they were nomadically going from zone to zone. If there was a storm or something, they would leave that region for a year and come back and they would slash and burn a place. And then they would get all the bison and then come back to that place. And this is a very primitive story. It doesn't, you know, that's the big um, mutual exclusion between this idea. There's no reason for that. It could be very easily that they had, Scythian caravans that were highly sophisticated that were bringing all sorts of things places and we're, you know now we're able to use lidar detection to see where great migratory patterns have been we see more migratory patterns like that that would implicate uh, wheels in a place that supposedly they didn't have wheels in the Americas in the central and, you know we, less that around Egypt right where we're supposed to have 40 years of desert walking in the Bible. So there's more evidence in, you know, in America for that to exist historically. So it could very well be we had um, giant caravans that were, you know, like really nice inside, like Genghis Khan's caravans, but with projectors, who knows, you know? That just gave me a great idea that I'll keep to myself for right now, but that uh, I'll bring back up with did you come up with a new Burning Man art car? Is that what you're thinking? Uh, no, no, just a great opportunity to get back together again on an, on the tangent that, that excellent did me up. So, uh, well, th this gentleman's about to wrap up with this uh, presentation. He's going to uh, finish with these predictions. Uh, he's going to finish with predictions of damage in the modern uh, cities in this area. And what year? What year is the video? Sorry, the year the video was twenty eleven. The, it, the talk was given in 2011 and the video was taken. This was uploaded to YouTube in 2014. So it's been kicking around on YouTube for a while. Uh, he will okay, be- Okay, let's see yeah. how, the, how his prediction, predictions were. Great, great. And then he is gonna make a brief mention of the conspiracy theorists at the end here as well. He'll take a quick shot at them right before the end. So stay tuned for that. Let's get this screen back up and continue well because there is a real potential danger there's a lot more people in that area now if one of these big earthquakes hit it's going to really be a bad deal uh fema and uh, the coast guard and uh corps of engineers and a bunch of other people pulled their money to put together this big study of that area they looked at the three basic fault areas the north fault the real foot fault and the budio fault and uh, they looked at them individually, if this one went, if this one went, if this one went. Then they looked at all three of them together. They all three went at once with a magnitude of 7.7, .7, what would the damage be? And this is really pretty interesting. There'd be about $300 billion worth of damage to these 140 counties that are part of uh, eight different states in that area. There'd probably be something on the order of about 3,500 fatalities and lots of injuries, probably another 82,000 people injured, maybe almost 2,000 of those with life-threatening injuries. On top of that, you're going to lose 129 hospitals in that area. And so there goes 1,600 beds. So you don't have anywhere to put these injured people. Plus, you have all the people that are normally at risk with all their normal medical problems that have to do so, have to go somewhere. They're going to need hospital care, too. You're going to have a lot of buildings collapse. A total of 32,500 buildings in that area are going to collapse. And this tells you by state in that area what percentage of the buildings are going to actually totally collapse and whether it's going to be damaged. And of course, there's going to be people buried in those collapses, so you're going to need search and rescue teams. They estimate you'll need about 1,500 search and rescue teams, about 40,000 people to go out and search all of this material to try to see how many survivors they can come up with. And a lot of people are going to be seeking shelters because their houses are going to be destroyed. The first day after that earthquake, there'll be 200,000 people looking for shelter. By day three, an order of magnitude more, 2 million people looking for shelter. This is a big problem. It's really nice to know that these people are thinking about it. Power outages within that area there, about half the homes are going to lose power. And about an equal number in that area are going to lose their household waters. Major bridges to transport health in, into this area. These are major bridges along the Mississippi, Ohio, and the, and the Arkansas here. The red ones indicate ones that will be damaged probably to the point of not being able to use them anymore. So you lose a lot of your transportation network in that area. There's 10 major pipelines that run through there that will all break in a number of places. 
So you can see you're going to have a real, real disaster on your hands there. Well, disaster is just what a lot of people are looking for. <laughs> and uh, so you see lots of people that have these crazy predictions uh, on the internet, all your favorite websites about the new magic earthquake is going to go off again, et cetera. Uh, one of my favorites was back here in oh, December 3rd, 1990, when good old Dr. Ivan Browning, who was a, a climatologist, he, uh, he predicted that uh, December 3rd, all the planets were going to line up, and that total gravity field was going to just cause all sorts of havoc on Earth. It was going to kick loose this earthquake, and it was going to be the worst thing in the world. Of course, almost no scientists agreed with him, but uh, the media loved it. So this <laughs> one, <they> called the media. <laughs> 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 oh, that's an asteroid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure which. Of course, one thing that did happen from that is some people made a lot of money so those survivals. He knew about the asteroids or comets. The 2012, this is December 31st, and it's also what you know, when uh, the end of the world is going to come for sure. The ancient calendar tells you so. The movies tell you so. It's got to happen. Well, this is what this prophecy says. There'll be a giant earthquake under Madrid in the Another one here about Champaign-Urbana area that's going to actually split the continent off here. Okay? So what that's going to do is open this big waterway here, plus the continent is going to sag down all the eastern shore, the seaboard, uh, Florida, all these places are going underwater, and much of uh, California is going underwater, much of the west is going underwater. This is going to be a really disaster. December 21st, 2012, look at your calendar. Seaside property. Here's another, here's another map that does give us seaside property. Of course, being 2011, the 2012 prophecies were super popular right about this time. So anyway, those are a few of the prophecies, and most of these guys have their, their head. He should have, he should have Googled the Stalin trait. He should have Googled for Stalin's trait. Do you know what Stalin's yeah. trait look like? No. It's, it's like it's a Me great river. Mexico, Canada, and nothing in between. That's called Stalin's Strait. Huh. Wow. I have to find a video now on the Stalin Strait river, so, uh, like post Soviet Union river rafters. They make like their own inflatable rafts and they're like, they look like giant wheels and they're inside of them with a stick and like people wow. die. It's pretty intense. <laughs> it's like beyond five rapids. And, and then All right, here we go. He's just about done nowhere. here. It's pedestal during the San Francisco earthquake. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that's a new matter earthquake, and I'll be glad to uh, take any questions. And I'll be around a little while. Unfortunately, we didn't get the question and answer session. Yeah, that really was it. I thought he had a few more seconds of it. Um, well, actually, I, I like those uh, scientists lecturing the people that's going to be paying them in the future. So those are the future specialists of the local regional companies and so on. And they're going to be assigning those budgets for spendings like this scientists is promoting to do. Yeah. Yep. Plus, we're going to have all these people, lovely people here, to ask the questions that they couldn't ask themselves. And I think uh, I would also recommend we end at some point by giving them that homework assignment that we had to watch because I because it sounds like Phil and I both watched it and you did too. So I'm tempted to, to I'm tempted to say that they we have it. leeway. I can I mean I've got it in my history right here and we can save it for another time. Morning. Well, no, I was no, thinking no. about I have a timestamp where she tells just like we could run two minutes of it. And I'm not against it because it's an important COVID. video. I, I love uh, that video. I actually saw it like four years ago, three or four years ago. I think right? we were getting into this and it's, it's really, uh, you know, she also opens up a bit about what was going on around the world at the time. And I think that it puts it in perspective. Let's see if I can. Uh, I think you should put, put on the beginning when she's trying to describe the history, like with the picture of lightning right? and stuff like that. Oh, Philip, have you heard of Elatra? Do you know what this is, Alatra? Demonstration. All right, I gotta send you this. There's a there's a Russian group that's doing. Um, they're they are sending information. They have like a Tartarian thing, and they're sending information in pyramids they make in Russia across the room to each other, trying to like get a number telepathically to each other. And they're yeah, and they're it's pretty interesting. I I'll, I'll send you a link about it, Alatra. So I did find it, guys, um, and what I think, I, I mean, I don't see any reason why not. We've had a good group here with us the whole time. We still have like 16 people hanging with us, um, and uh, 
you know, this was a talk that I found in the process of, you know, researching further on the Ray Anderson talk, as the guys both uh, mentioned. And uh, thankfully, both of you guys got to peep this. Uh, so we'll add the link in the description for everybody who comes along after today and, and comes along after the live. We'll make sure you can get straight to this. But, um, you know, found this speech that was given in 2013. So almost a contemporary of Ray Anderson here. And um, I'm afraid I don't know the presenter's name off the top of my head here. They'll probably put it on screen here for us. We'll play just a minute or two of the beginning, and then I'll jump ahead to like 1244 or so, where she really tells us where she like found the nuggets of the interesting narrative to her. Um, and then everybody else who wants to can go back and watch, you know, both of these on their own. Uh, hopefully, start, I get some enjoyment. Start, start like from the third minute or something. Okay. Because uh, there's nothing in the first three. There we go. Let's go right about here. So my question is, how come she's good at one two five? About today, right? How come this terrain that is familiar to everybody here? Yeah. How come we don't know about these today? Yep. Although we know for sure that in the past it has been. So I want to talk a little bit about how we can come to understand this hunting story of bears in the woods, right? Why is it that an event that could be commonly understood 200 years ago? Yeah, she opened with a story from so Davy Crockett that Davy Crockett wrote about this so we're region. Talk about three different parts. One is what happened. What was he talking about? Yeah. What? By the way, just stop for a second. If that, if one reference in one book that is actually a fiction book that that it was like a bestseller book, so it, it probably. And mixed up with facts and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. just, just for it to be a bestseller uh how come one reference in the fiction book could be a good decent evidence and uh millions of evidence of like a pre-flood calling sure. something pre-flood in 19th century like people knew that the flood happened not that far away far ago and she's like trying to say look people read uh, that book and understood that something just happened not that far ago. Yep. So I mean, yeah. Of all the characters to have included it in one of his writings, a character like Davy Crockett, who half the people, you know, to this day will still have to check with themselves: was he real or was he a myth? You know, he's like one of those figures himself, and he was referencing events like this. It wasn't really a super specific reference of New Madrid, though, so we'll let it ride. But um yeah let's see what, let's see what she's got to say to us about why these things were first very well known in popular culture and then subsequently seem to not only have been like sort of forgotten but kind of like extra forgotten obfuscated almost why have those earthquakes been forgotten why is that such surprising news why is this one of the few places in the world where the person introducing a topic on this would actually say the name of that town right <laughs> Why would that new Madrid? Spain? You're doing this. I said, well, no, actually, I'm not working tonight. And then I'm going to end with a few reflections on a topic that I think is quite pressing interest in most of us here, which is why do those earthquakes matter today? Oh, and I want to tell you also that this slide may not look very visually impressive because it's a little blurry, but this is evidence of the best single use of research funding in my entire professional career, which was buying a tank of gas for the Piper aircraft that a friend of mine was co-owner of. Right when I was first exploring this project, I said, you know, I need to get a sense of quite literally the lay of the land. And he took me up. So um, I'm sure you have seen better aerial photographs of the Mississippi Valley, but never any that were quite so much as a personal hoop for me. So first, what happened? Why do these quakes matter in 1811-12? What was going on with them? Right? What are these things that Davy Crockett and others of the early 19th century were writing about and talking about? Again, it's such a pleasure to be in a part of the world where I actually probably didn't need to put this map up, but just in case anyone has wandered in from North Dakota, I'd like to indicate for you where the middle Mississippi Valley is and where the earthquake centers were in 1811-1812. Um, I've made this map a long time ago when I was trying to first figure out how to present this kind of material, and um, my kids were so little that there was a great deal of household disappointment that their mother was not, in fact, writing a history of pirates. But the, that piratical X indicates um, roughly the area of the epicenters. And the nice thing about this map, although it was not created for this purpose, is that the colored lines actually do a pretty good job of indicating where the earthquakes were felt and where we have reports of them from. So all up and down the, the American East Coast, up into Upper Canada, up north of the Great Lakes, and indeed out along the Mississippi, sorry, up the Mississippi and along the Missouri River. So these are quakes. So uh, for, for the purposes of 
you know, time we're going to, I'm going to try to jump ahead to that part where I think she's going to get again to a really cool part of her presentation. Everybody who bothered to stay this long again, thank you guys for being here and staying. And uh, definitely this is a great follow-up video for you to find and watch if you haven't uh, watched it at all. If you made it this far, you probably like this topic a little bit. So um, let's see if I remembered my timestamp right. A local mount, because horses from far away would be too disturbed by the continuing tremors. Animals that had been born and reared in the Mississippi, in, in that part of the world, were undisturbed by the continuing tremors. A kind of party trick in that part of the world up through the 1840s was to take a stranger over to a fence post and have him put their hand on the post because you could often feel a slight tremor in that post that bipedal bodies don't sense as well. So that's what happened. What difference did it make? What'd that do? As people tell me, okay, so a tree falls in a swamp. Nobody's there to hear it. What difference does that make? I spent a long time researching to find out some of that answer. And this illustration tells us part of why. This is one of the only illustrations I've found of native people living in the swamps of East Arkansas and Southeast Missouri in the 19th century. It's very interesting because it, Here it is there after the Civil War when few were left at that time. But this is accurate about who was living there before the quakes hit. What I found, and this was really cool historical work, this is like the kind of stuff that makes historians get up in the morning, I found stuff in the basement of an archive oh, that was lost, it. and it was old scratchy pieces of paper that made a new story. I found records of Cherokees and other Native Americans from the Eastern United States moving into that region in the late 19th century, excuse me, late 18th century and the early 19th century. I found records of massive Indian trade in that area. This was, Northeast Arkansas was a booming site of settlement, of trade, of diplomacy, from about the 1780s and 90s up through the 1800s. After this earthquake, people voted with their feet and they left. So the history that gets written is, well, nobody was living there, it was just a swamp. It was really deserted and messed up and you couldn't really travel very freely around it. That's right, that was true after 1812. That was not true for the 30 years before. The St. Francis River was a major conduit, not just a backwater. The quakes were part of Indian movements throughout much of the Eastern United States. They were a part of the ad all right, I think I'll pause it there again. Dude, girls, girls excited about women excited about history and anthropology. She, are she had that a good one she, here, right? She had her hands on a good one here with this story. She gets super, super excited about like finding that information for good reasons. Because where is it? Why is it so hard to find evidence of people living in swamps? I mean, this is what Emerson and Irving are yeah. writing about in the 1811, 1812. Why are these stories so prominent then? And yet, where's the evidence? Uh, yeah, no, I, I think I ask myself when she makes a statement like that, you know, what was happening in the 50 years prior to when it is noted in history to be that vibrant, to be that place that was noteworthy, that although there's only an echo of it today, at least we have that echo because something set the stage for that to be what it was uh so uh great talk though uh from this presenter and gosh dang it i wish i uh can see it they don't even put her name in the in the description oh, I, I like the way she Connor finished valencius is her name excuse me go ahead go ahead continue she finished with the answering question somebody answer, uh, asked her a question about fracking or something yeah, they did and she kindly you know yeah. touch this topic uh and this is uh, what's uh, similar to the previous yeah, guy because he sure was mentioned fracking it's 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 the main uh source that is yeah. what i'm trying to say like somebody came somebody mined somebody took all these resources somebody made up the story yeah. somebody made up the mess each mining area you find right now in the world is a, is a huge mess. Each area that was abandoned by the miners is a huge mess. It's an ecological disaster, especially fracking. And uh, depending on those researchers that say that fracking is rather good, it could be ecological friendly and so and so on and so forth. Just, just all these guys are trying to spend money for fake research and uh, telling us that it's rather safe. Well, it's not safe, and uh, we see plenty examples of disasters that can happen, even with the technologies and the level of technology that we have today, when you have all these digital sensors and everything and so on. But Yeah, the sensors just tell us that it's going sideways down there. 
that's all it doesn't stop it from going sideways down there yeah so my my point is that she's probably also sponsored by by, by those companies when she's promoting this agenda that you know nothing is actually related to fracking and all those earthquakes uh won't happen again because of only fracking only fracking and so on so it's like more natural uh, probability that rather than uh, something artificial which is my theory because my theory is that those cases are artificial and of course they are set up and looking at the the case with Karabakh that we right now have remember that it all started back in um, 1988 and it was like a rather slow conflict and it's also a very mined area because you know a bunch of natural resources in Karabakh including uranium and so on and uh, Azerbaijan area is a huge mining area a bunch of oil there and so on so a bunch of gas there and uh, one of the biggest gas pipelines that is passing right through this area so what I'm trying to say is that they had a conflict back in 18 uh, 1988 and in 1980 uh, 1992 I think they had a huge earthquake there which totally you know made people migrate to russia and other places like you know oh, turkey okay. and so, so it broke the area they had to yeah yeah the and, the, and the conflict for 30 years there's a war still there so people just you know wow. this they, they used to live about two million people there and right now it's like around three hundred thousand. so just wow. imagine how many people left it's like more and than the, half the foundlings left. the whole thing with the city wow the yeah. whole people all so many people dying also led to their children or even not just having their children taken but like the children who were foundlings trained everywhere to russia and back in canada like anywhere you were they would take them during because this was happening everywhere this wasn't just new madrid this is you know venezuela and moscow are having things at the exact exact same time so the children are then sent to a lot of the time sterile survivors and there's so many people at this time who can't have kids which is also a really weird you know kind of yeah. that that nuclear coincidence yeah, that they have yeah. these stories and then they the have they, was a problem at times pretty weird right yeah, yeah. <laughs> right after that and then they give them the other kids and then those yeah, crazy the well, huh. it's pretty pretty big bummer but yeah those kids who were russian became canadian Canadian and uh, American that region kids went to Russia or into South America and a lot of people got mixed like we're talking about tens of thousands at a time you know 30,000 kids from one region to another region uh, at a time you know in one one grouping so and then there'd be millions of kids in a year so it's just yeah well so what uh, I'm trying to say is yeah. mining mining the area is the huge uh, target area for for those who want to make money right so they can do and set up whatever case that could look like an earthquake they can look like a war they can they could look like a you know flooding i don't know mm -hmm. anything that can be set up very easy like uh, you know changing the river uh you know streaming and so on so right uh, that also could be explained because you know those people were rather uneducated back then is what the, the officials say and that that's why how can we believe their stories actually of uh the people who were t telling those stories not in the period of of the of the event in 1811 and 1812 they were telling their stories after like 15 20 years 30 years we are talking only about that evidence because they don't have any actual evidence at the at this certain period of time right because they got arrested or they got asylumed but like and 260 very days suspicious. they want to do it very long and uh, this is this one that is actually looks long because they say the tremors uh, appeared to happen for like 30 40 years everybody knew that this was a yep. dangerous area everybody it was just weird that way and quakes happened all the time yeah yeah and they have to hire the horses of local people not you know walk through with the, the the horses from the east coast or the west coast because those horses would be scared of the earthquakes and tremors right so that, you know it's just you know ridiculous to hear all this stuff and I mean um, I think miners are behind this agenda and they are trying to repeat it one more time so uh, when they ready to do that 
the area will be reset and okay, so reset. and so on. I don't know. There the only go. explanation is that. So sure. I mean somebody's trying to do something and those hot spots are everywhere. We can name those hot spots. Uh North Korea, um Himalaya and you know all this uh area where China versus India where right now people are fighting with the sticks. Around three hundred people uh, are actually killed this year. I with the stick it. fighting have it, you heard about it yeah i did hear something about that it was like a massacre stick man they oh, they're, people no, they're doing killed. open combat this way yeah Crazy. because they, they have a prohibition of shooting and they all they can do yeah. is fight with the sticks so stick fights over there then you have syria then you have karabakh right now you have uh belarus uh ukraine you have yugoslavia which is totally on the edge of conflict anytime when you want to start it, it's going to ignite in Kosovo and this whatever. Is, you know, so, Belarus is crazy is, right now. Yeah. And they want to make this as much martial arts. Arts in the U.S. They want to make as much hotspots in the U.S. Uh, as they want. So the the Southern Bay Area, uh, the Mexican Bay Area was always famous for hurricanes and all these disasters, New Orleans and all this stuff. And hurricanes come each year like three four times major hurricanes come right so mm -hmm. and they want to make another one yep. and probably make it uh, so they can make mo as much money as they can make on this you know budget spendings and preparedness and femas and so this mm -hmm. stuff. So, not to mention so of course, the public who go out and spend of course to prep for the emergencies remember that guy showed the list of 1996 casualties how many people were uh, dead of what if you place coronavirus it'd be like right now a third of, uh, third line in that list of 1996 of the casualties and in the earthquake earthquakes were like last two points seven people were dead in earthquakes so they want to make earthquakes a little bit uh, higher in that list I, I, I yeah so that would be more actual in agenda and the media coverage like you have forest fires in california like remember a year a year ago who would expect so many you know stuff uh, that would happen in in 2020 except wow. we we and andreas we were always expecting all this stuff cough <laughs> uh. <laughs> Oh, I tell you what, I love it. Guys, see, that's the thing. I, I appreciate the, the fact that you guys spent this much time in a story like this that is clearly anomalous and not super directly connected to absolutely everything else. But what Andreas is great for is picking up on the that meta level that I also inhabit, which is like these things do seem to occur both natural and seemingly unnatural at times and similar transformations occur in the the land and the people in the areas each generation and it's just so interesting and challenging to be able to hold on to that real history and parse what we're left with today uh, because we see narrative shaping happening almost from the time of the event that becomes, you know, handed down as lore and then becomes history book facts and is talked about by professors in front of, you know, academically friendly audiences and, and is used as support for entire industries, as we know, to go and have their way with entire regions and the resources therein including the human resources therein so uh, and then that's exactly why as soon as i came across that ray anderson talk i was like oh, i gotta i gotta ask both guys if i can get you guys on to sit and talk about this because you guys were just the first two to spring to mind as i was listening to that first talk and then it was a great uh, help to also hear this woman's presentation which was so much more about that interesting narrative level and and what happened with political forces and uh like industry as well that had reasons for minimizing this story into the past and saying settle down everybody move back go to work we're building factories industry's coming back everything's going to be fine 
So well, I, I would also add just because on the on the level of where Missouri is in America, it's south of Iowa, south of um, Minnesota, and so I'm in Minnesota now. Like the water works that go down that direction. If you see all the way up that way, all of the things where there's there's a place called Alexandria near here mm -hmm. that has um they have there's their paul bunyan land but paul bunyan land is a place where they had giants as a story that the indians believed in yeah. and so they've you know and the french had their interaction with them and it became paul bunyan and you have like um this giant rune stone but the rune stone is like you know they say it's fake but you go look at it it's like it's not and it has um, a story of like, we came along the river line to follow the old trade route, but then these uh, people uh, attacked us because they had, you know, we hadn't been here in like centuries. Uh, we just found this old route. So, you know, we had to leave essentially. And like, we lost several men, buried them here, put up the stone and left. And, you know, for lots of reasons, they've kind of kept the Alexandria uh, runestone kind of secret. I mean, um, that's Terry Gill Terry Gilliam is from Minnesota, the guy from um, Monty Python. Sure, so he's sure. that's how I found out about it. Yep. So he he believes in it. So I was like, all right, I'll give, I'll give it a shot. I think I think there's a lot of evidence in this area for that Scythian Tartarian idea of a trade network, where there are regions that people come together as ga at gathering points the longest day of the year or in that you know time sure. frame. But those and, being seasonal and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because people that are nomadic have to follow with the sure. and they're all kind of nomadic. You've got people that are in that area, but they're still moving from area to area, you know, in you know, the Midwest. And then you have people that are just literally following the endless summer route of trading with them back and forth because you've got this equatorial trade system. So I think that there's plenty of evidence that the water lines made that possible because without them, yep. you know, you, you couldn't have done it the same way. And, you know, we talk off, often about fuel and everything, which like really wind sailing is super fast and the kinds of boats that they had. I mean, it's, it's evidenced by the fact that the kinds of boats that they have, the kinds of roofs that they have are like flipped boats and the boats are the same boats that they have in the Viking lands are the same boats they have in a retreat on the east side of Africa. So that's like gives you an idea that they either had to go and could go around or they could go through the thinnest water lines of the Nile. So these boats were able to deal with Mississippi line um, and everywhere to Missouri. And that's so the question is, how could you do it? How could you go that far south? But the thing is, you could. The boats were able to handle thin waters and clearly the Indians were doing it. Yep. And the French were reestablishing these trade lines and they've you know evidence that they did it because they were the Norman French. So I don't know. It, it seems like there's like every little thing ties it together. Like that's not that it's not, you know, it's not that it's some weird thing, Tartaria. It's really just the only thing that explains how all of these things could have possibly anomalously happened is some interaction, you know? Well, it's interesting. The point you made about the waterways, because for me, sometimes one of the most interesting things about listening to a talk is making note of things that someone mentions very briefly or in passing, but did include in their presentation. And he did point out that the waterways were incredibly important in that region. And that's, you know, just natural straight history, of course, as well. But he didn't expand upon it very much, very much, excuse me, except to say that they were greatly disrupted and changed permanently as a result of this. And, as, and, and the uh, Mississippi Delta, you know, in, in a certain part around New Madrid where the town was lost and immediately like north and south of it, that's where the river flowed backwards. That's where a whole town was lost and other towns were impacted or also lost. Um, so it was mentioned yeah. it, like two sentences. They, and, they oh, give you this, so. they give you this terrible devastation story though, that kind of infers that there was a lot going on right before it, which is, I think Philip was bringing up. It's like, how do you have that much devastation unless there was a lot going on, yeah. you know? Yep. And uh, also they believe this story uh, just with no evidence. Davy Crockett's but auto don't believe the mud flood. Exactly. They don't believe the mud flood and they prefer, they prefer to call it a horse crap, you know, explanation and basement explanation. Then, uh, but dude, we need at our the same own, time they believe in this. We need a Tartarian holiday. Without any, we should evidence. come up with like a thing, like you know, like it should have candles and presents, and it just because yeah, it's time. Well, I don't know. 
Yeah, and what about cotton? What about cotton, guys? Once you were mining, you oh, devastated yeah. the area, made it the wasteland. And how can you make some money from that? Drain the swamp and do the cotton. So Parts that's what they're doing, and they make making oh, money. Well, and that's okay. That's also the biggest link back to the whole tartary thing, right? Because what is cotton? It's the tartary vegetable sheep, and like some of the oldest I stories that sheep. people that I people listened to that presentation of yours the other day, by the way, that where you went in on the uh, tartary sheep. Um, I mean, that's how I yeah. kind of was thinking about tartary because in school they tell you tartary is the vegetable sheep story that. The Italian Renaissance painters were thinking there's a magical Tartarian world far easter than east and far wester than west. And in Tartary, they have a sheep. It's a vegetable sheep, but it's just the cotton bush. And so if you went to school, you're supposed to know not you're supposed to know better than to believe in Tartary. And this is like 10 years ago, you know, at least, God, being old. But they they've set it up to to kind of explain that Tartary was real and that there was a cotton plant and that it was used to produce um you know, some, and cotton is anomalous. Like you look at the genetic um, sequence of cotton, and you can go off on how it's it's like how how do these things exist in nature? But cotton's pretty strange. You know, there's our tartary sheep. Yeah, and this is these yeah. are these are actually the thing is there actually are in the world plants that grow like this that look like that. That's a not cotton. It's a kind of let me see. There's another thing that actually grows like that somewhere that has, you know, weird looking claws. Some real, yeah. The yeah. vegetable lamb of Tartary. Oh, look at that. They got one under glass. Yeah. Guys, uh, I want to thank you both so, so much. I think we should uh, probably get ready to wrap it. Let Philip uh, wind down his evening as well. Uh, we've had an amazing group. We've had a good 24, 25 people hanging with us this whole time. Uh, so unprecedented. And I give both of you all the credit in the world for that. Uh, I doubt anybody who came here on my own channel uh, isn't already subscribed to the both of you. But if anybody is new today, Philip Drujinin and Andreas Exertus will provide you with many, many hours of really rewarding uh, content on their research, interpretations, and theories about both Mud Flood and Grand Tartaria, and as well as many other amazing mysteries and topics. Uh, you guys are so, so rad. Thank you guys so much for uh, coming. Um, and uh, I might add that if you were going to use uh, Baked and Awake, you can actually tell Alexa, I got my phone to do it, and it'll play Baked and Awake right yes. through it now. Yes, Just, that's the way. Just do that so, everywhere you guys see one of those smart speakers. Please. Yeah, so seriously, look if you want to hear Baked yes. and Awake everywhere you go, like do it. It's amazing. There's so many facilitations. Good job on that, Steve. That's awesome. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. No Everybody uh, in the chat, thank you guys for keeping it awesome in there as well. I didn't I didn't see any shenanigans in the chat. So great community, everybody. We'll do this again real soon, real soon. Thanks, everybody. Happy Tartarian season. Hey, no. Bye-bye.